Hey everybody, it's Savage Lands News, and today is a grand day. We are kicking off the ultimate Rhinar guide starting today. Uh, this is going to be a multi, multi part series in which I'm going to dive into the details of almost every single aspect of Rhinar and the Brute class. I will not be touching Levia, right? You know who to go see if you want some Levia content, <coughs> Ethan Mansant. But for Rhinar and any Brute specific card that Rhinar can touch, we are going to talk about it. We're going to talk about Rhinar concepts. We're going to get back into the math a little bit. Although I have entire math videos, so I won't be diving too much into the math again. I'll just point you back over there. And then at the end of all of this, I'm going to be writing some sort of guide that I'll release somewhere, somehow. Okay, but this is going to be a multi-part video series. So let's kick it off. We're going to start part one, general Rhinar concepts. And that is going to be very high level. Those of you who understand Rhinar, maybe I can give you a couple things. Uh, but those of you who are new, this video is like right here for you. Okay. And then after this, we're going to be going into card analysis and I'll kind of get into the details of what I think of each one of his cards and give them a grade and that kind of stuff. Right. So let's let's go into it. All right. So what makes Reinar Reinar? Well, for one, he's a brute hero. OK, uh, for better or worse. So as defined by LSS, James White, right? Uh, bru brutes are defined by their very high, quote unquote, it used to be very high attack power. Right. So you're going to be seeing a lot of sixes, a lot of sevens, some eights and some nines in Reinar list. Right. They're hitting pretty, pretty decent. Two card six used to be very, you know, on rate going above. That was a, considered being above rate. Although I think in the modern era of fab uh, brutes have fallen behind a little bit on like what their cards values are. But we'll get into that later. So high attack power cards, high variance gameplay. So if you're not into high variance gameplay, Reinar is not for you. Um, I mean, although there are certain lists that we'll talk about later that do kind of cater the, the, the variance down to as much as possible to like an acceptable level at its nature, brutes are very high variance, right? Scab skins exist. It is the legendary that we're going to use on our equipment. And that is a variance card. And then unfortunately, dice rolling seems to be a big part of the thematics of, uh, brutes, uh, probably my least favorite part of the brute class, to be honest. I mean, like I enjoy rolling dice. It's fun. Gambling is super fun. Um, and it's always nice when like you hit that wild six on a big turn, but you know, dice rolling is part of it. Variance is part of it. Discarding is part of it. That's what defines what brutes are. All right. And then for Reinar specifically, intimidate and discarding are his core concepts. So to me, I think this is the main issue with balancing Reinar, right? Intimidate is probably the strongest hero, strongest class power in the game. I know you're probably like, why isn't Reinar crushing every single event? Well, because of how powerful it innately is, there's a lot of gating going on, controlling Reinar's ability to do too much damage or do too many intimidates every turn. And so that's where that variance comes in, right? We don't have that many blue sixes, but we have a very expensive cost curve. So that means that inherently in our deck are a lot of cards that won't trigger Intimidate. It also has a lot of cards that increase the variance of things like Blood Rush Bellows, Intimidate, Wild Ride and Pulping, um, uh, you know, right? So there's a lot of misses in our deck. So you have to play around his very strong hero power because if Reinar did 20 damage a turn, intimidated your hand two, three times a turn, he would LL faster than Starvo did, right? He would be doing uncontested damage that you can't interact with. So Intimidate and his hero power are incredibly strong in the right scenarios. But right now, they're only relevant if your opponent wanted to block anyways. In current flesh and blood with a lot of these aggro heroes out there, they don't want to block. So your hero power doesn't really exist until you're trying to kill him, right? And then he's one of the few heroes who's actively disrupting your opponent's game plan on your turn. You know, aside from like Frostbites, Reinar is to, you know, and I guess dominate. But Reinar can basically force your opponent to block with cards that they don't want to. Right? If you intimidate their two cards they would prefer to block with, you leave them with their two good offensive cards, and your attack is coming in for a lot or it might kill them, they're going to be forced to block with those two cards. And that's really powerful, right? I call it Reinar locking right? When my opponent's below three life, and that's an important threshold because it requires 
two cards to be given up for every one of my six powers. Uh, any card that naturally has Intimidate on it, I am reducing their ability to choose what they block with. And maybe I'm forcing them to block with cards they didn't want to block with, right? Um, insane armor, kind of. <laughs> I actually think Reinar's armor is one of the main areas that he could get an improvement on. Uh, because as a mid-range hero, he's a little slower than everybody else. Uh, he doesn't have really cards that or armor that blocks that well. Now, Scabskins does. Scabskins is nuts. It is probably the single most powerful piece of equipment in the game. It is a three blocking piece of equipment that exists perpetually after you've done block after you're done blocking and it can generate action points on command. Basically one of the only heroes that can look at Arclight Sentinel and be like, okay, I'm going to pop it and then continue my turn. Right. However, it has a huge downside uh, and we'll get into that later. Uh, and it's probably another one of the reasons that he's difficult to balance. And then right now, I would say Brutes in general, but specifically Reinar, they're combo heroes, right? A lot of their big plays require setup, they require cost curves, and they require sixes, right? So Blood Rush Bellows being the premier combo card in the deck, your turns basically live, or your games basically live or die by Blood Rush Bellows, right? You can do 20 plus damage, even his other new powerful cards like Berserk, um, Savage Beatdown, they all revolve around these kind of big setups to do this massive turn of damage. Okay, so now that we kind of understand what makes Reinar Reinar, let's talk about his strengths. Uh, Reinar is probably the strongest anti-fatigue hero in the game, right there next to like Pistol Dash. Uh, he was one of the few heroes with a, fence or with a positive win rate on the ultim. I'm very sad ultim has gone, to be honest. It was one of the best parts of being a Reinar player. Um, so yeah, games will typically never end by you being fatigued typically right you're either going to kill your opponent or you're going to die trying typically and that's fun uh blood rush bellows is probably one of the most overpowered cards in the game uh it's only because it's a brute class card that it's kind of okay i would say right think of it's basically art of war times two kind of nuts uh reinar can spike games insanely fast kind of like kano levels of just absolute steamrolling somebody and because scab sins exist, you can take your bad matchups and potentially make them better, right? You can kind of roll your way out of a losing game sometimes. Of course, you could roll your way into an auto loss, but Reinar and Brutes in general, one of the only classes that can go, okay, I'm losing. Let's let's throw some dice and see if I can win. Um, so yes, scab skins wins games by itself, loses games by itself. And then if you just see all your blood rushes super early, you will pretty much run any hero over and there's nothing they can do about it. Um, and then Reinar has a very flexible game plan. He's a mid-range hero. He can kind of flip between defensive and offensive in the middle of a game, between games. Um, he has a lot of aggressive cards and a lot of defensive cards that you can use uh, in your like toolbox, right? Um, and he's also able to use Pummel, right? He's like one of the two heroes that can, re or one of the two classes that can really use Pummel. So he, when, when you flip Reinar, your opponent has a very slim chance of guessing what kind of Reinar deck you are. And even if they have a good idea that you're on like maybe the most common one, there's a lot of variance inside of those decks, right? There's a lot of different card choices that very good players with good results are putting in. So it's not very homogenized, which is a, a plus for us. Um, and Reinar just has some of the most insane, most like adrenaline filled turns you'll ever see. First time you get off a Savage Beatdown in a big event is like, oh, it's amazing. It's so much fun. Card comes in for 12 and, and then 14 to 20 if you buff it with some blood rushes and barragings nuts uh if you've ever berserked somebody <laughs> from 36 to zero there's it's a lot of fun to play right some crazy things you can do with reinar if you if the if the stars align and then reinar is probably the cheapest hero in the game to play to purchase his cards uh i have blitz decks that you can start the game with pretty much top tier missing like two pieces of equipment uh, for less than like $30. They're crazy. I'll put them in the description below. Same thing with CC, you know, aside from the couple pieces of um, equipment that he has and like command and conquer, you can pretty much get a tournament level Reinar CC deck up for less than a hundred bucks. Crazy. Now let's talk about his weaknesses. Uh, because he's a brute, his best lines almost always involve variants. Um, and that is like the real skill of playing Reinar, in my opinion, is calculating the risk to reward ratio for all of your variants plays. And Scabskin's existing enhances that 
every single turn, right? Are you going to take extra damage to roll on scabs? Is it worth it? Is the return on investment going to be worth it? What happens if you roll a one? Can you recover? What happens if you don't get your, your two, I mean, your four or your six on the dice? Can you, can you recover the game? Is your arsenal open, right? All of these very high variance plays are very taxing to work through. And sometimes you'll, they just won't work out, you know? Um, Renner is also really bad into aggro heroes on average. Uh, you know, I was able to figure out Phi last season, right? And that was, you know, the premier aggro deck of the time. Uh, this season, I've been working on the Lexi matchup, and honestly, <laughs> I can't figure it out to save my life. So right now, you know, Reiner has some bad matchups, and it's almost always the premier aggro hero. Um, and old if ll so aggro might be on the rise. But we'll see what happens with the next couple sets. Um, games can crumble right before your eyes, right? So I, uh, I've always kind of told people who play Reiner this, that like you go into a calling event or nationals or pro tour or whatever, you can pretty much expect that two of the games you play will just be auto losses. And it's not because you didn't do it right. It's because your deck like imploded, right? You rolled three ones in a row. Um, you know, your, your blood rush drew, drew you two DBX and you have nothing you could play. Uh, your blood rush drew only reds. Um, you know, things like that happen. And scab skins, honestly, it's a, it's a one in six chance to lose your turn, but it happens way more often than I would like to uh, admit. And then, like I said before, sometimes the risky lines that you bet on don't pay off. So like Savage Feast, you have to keep three cards in your hand. You have to hit on scab skins on your turn. If you don't hit with scab skins, you know, your turn kind of goes from 20 something damage to six. <laughs> and that's a big disparity because you didn't get the, the four on the dice. It's huge. And it's hard to play games around that. And then Reinar is like the ultimate test of mental, right? Uh, he really encourages you to be greedy. But as soon as you become greedy, you lose. And I don't really know, like, it, this is like a very common thing amongst brood players, but you have to be greedy to some extent. But as soon as you get too greedy, you're punished beyond all belief and you'll lose that game instantly, right? So you have to find the balance. And, you know, a lot of players have leaned into the math of the game to try, try and find the balance. But there is some instinct in there, right? You have to understand game state. You have to understand if you need to roll, if you don't need to roll, where you are, what's, you know, how many cards away you think you are from your next blood rush, blah, 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 right? And then I think the biggest weakness, honestly, is if you're playing at a tournament and you beat somebody, a lot of the time they get mad, right? People hate losing to Reinar. They hate it. They hate feeling like they got high rolled. Even... Even if they're a Briar player, right? We have the same game plan and their cards are better. I, you know, I've beaten a couple of Briars and it's like literally like, wow, can't believe you high rolled me, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, well, you know, <laughs> some, you're like the third Briar I beat today. So, you know, but yeah, people hate losing to you and you're going to have to get used to it. You hurt feelings sometimes. And then sometimes you do have a game where it's like, yeah, I drew three blood rushes in three turns and you lost it. Sorry. You know, it's kind of the Kano problem. Sometimes you just kill somebody instantly. All right, so let's talk about the Reinar playstyles that exist today. I'm going to oversimplify some of these because there's a couple. Reinar is like a, he has a lot of unique playstyles, I think more than most other heroes, in my opinion. And I think it's because Reinar's cards are truly all over the place. There's a lot of different ones, right? There's discarding cards. There's like the non-blocking aggressive cheetah cards. There's the new like savage beatdown that requires a lot of setup. We have a lot of unique weapons like rock, like meat axe, uh, club, claws. So Reiner has a lot of different like options. So right now, I would say the most competitive list right now is Tank Reinar. It's the version, it's the version of the Reinar that I play. It's the version that Chandler took into the top eight or the winning of the calling. Um, recently, we've seen a lot of players like Dex, like last week, take down a tournament or get really a top eight with a Tank Reinar list. Um, I would say it's the most common and tournament worthy version of Reinar, right? So your entire game plan revolves around Blood Rush Bellows, and you're basically trying to stay alive until you see the card, right? And trade as effectively as you can, right? So send the swing bigs, send your CNCs, buy yourself time with D reacts and sigils and stuff like that. Find your Blood Rush, set it up perfectly, and fire it, and then try and do 20 plus damage and force your opponent to block. That's basically the tank Reinar game plan. Uh, it's very flexible, it's very consistent. Uh, for a Reinar deck, it's, which means it's still got variants. It's very consistent. Some people consider it boring, right? It doesn't really use a lot of those crazy brute cards. Um, and I would say because the list, the lists have really have been big, 
have begun to like homogenize. They're all getting a little bit closer to being the same. However, there are some pretty big differences between the major list out there. So I think that there's a lot of room to still explore Rhinar and the tank version. And then we have Cheetah Rhinar, which I would say is probably the most popular variant of Rhinar. This is like the full blown brute list, right? This is going wild. It's throwing the pulpings, it's throwing the wild rides, the tear limb from limbs. You're going with like, some of them have berserk and you're just trying to send as much absolute monster damage as you possibly can. And you're looking for those big blood rush combos. Uh, problems with it is, is that it's probably the highest variance version of the list next to like the club cheetah, which we'll talk about later. Very high variance, a lot of non blocks. So you will often lose to yourself, right? You'll play a pull bang, you'll have three cards or two cards left in your hand. You'll draw a non block or a non six, sorry. You'll draw a non six card, shuffle it, roll, and you hit it somehow, right? That one in three chance just ruined your whole turn. You went from doing 25 to 30 damage to doing six. <laughs> That's the worst. Or sometimes, you know, you'll just discard a blood rush and you're like, okay, I have two copies left and they're both at the bottom and this game's over, right? It's also very fun to play. So a lot of people love that version because it's so fun. It's wild. And then we have thick, I call it thick club Reinar. This was the version of Reinar floating around a long time during the Starvo meta, right? It's just DVX and then you club them to death, right? You use barragings in the club. Um, you use like pulping sometimes in the club because it's very high, very efficient line of damage and blocking value. You run things like unmovable. You run things like sink blows. Um, very tanky, very consistent game plan. It's slower and it does lock a lot of damage sometimes, right? It, it, it has a hard time closing games, especially because you're a lot of the time your best plays are, they're a little variancy. They rely on scab skins. Pulping could always like the most efficient pulping line with this would be, uh, pitch a blue play pulping, discard a random card off the top of your deck, which could very well be a defense reaction. And then swing your club for five off tunic. And of course that can fail instantly, right? Um, so yeah, lack some damage, hard to really push aggro decks down with this these days. Cheetah Club. There are, there's a couple variants of this out there where this is just like the most wild version of Rhinar I think that you could have. This is like rolling dice every turn. This is like using those crazy dice cards. This is like playing every non-block you can find, pushing all of the crazy brute cards to their maximum limit. However, Scabskins tends to be the entire deck. It's probably the highest risk versus reward version of Reinar. The EV on a lot of those lines is pretty bad. So over time, you're going to realize it's not that strong, I would say. And then, you know, you might draw four non-blocks in one turn and just get obliterated. And then Medax Reinar. This is uh, one of the more recent lists that's been coming around. Uh, people are exploring it a lot right now. I'm actually currently exploring it, especially with old him leaving the meta. Uh, it's just... It's, it's kind of close to the the club variants, only it has some unique lines, right? So you can do things like pitch Medax into, or scab skins into Medax into Savage Beatdown. It's pretty sick. Uh, you can enable discard card clauses and intimidate cards just with your weapon. So, you know, Rumble Grunting is kind of a unique one. You could technically just Medax into Rumble Grunting into a card, and it's probably the most effective way to actually play that card. Uh, it can switch between aggro and like mid-range tank, right? You can do the whole block nine swing five, which is actually a pretty good floor to have. And I think it's worth exploring. I think this one could be the next, it's hard to tell. It has a lot of variants still, right? The variants being scab skins, the variants being, you know, if you want to run berserk or something wild like that, uh, but it's worth exploring. <clears throat> okay, so now we're going to talk about card evaluation because after this, we're going to jump into the big list of brute cards and I'm going to talk about them. But if you haven't seen my other videos, I have entire videos on math, uh, brute math and card evaluation. But here we're going to do it really quick. Offensive value of the card is how much the card is worth attacking with. Defensive, how much is worth defending with, right? The pitch value up here at the top right corner is how much it costs to play the card. And typically, the way Flesh and Blood is designed, cards have a higher value when they attack. So four versus when they defend three. Typically. So a lot of the time it is the less, it is the less mathematically correct thing to do to block. But with Brute, well, when we'll see in a second, doesn't have that many ways to dump four cards. So if we look at this one, we run this simple hand evaluation calculator. So the total number of offensive and defensive value of all the cards in your hand is your total hand value. And the value calculation would be in a perfect world, 
every card would be worth four. So if we were trying to be perfect every single turn, although this is like really unlikely, it's not really that possible, but this is just how I do it as a baseline. We'd want to somehow get four value out of every card in our hand. Okay. So that would mean like somehow playing every single one of these, adding it all together and getting four per card. So swing big in this example has a power of eight, right? So that's our most effective card to attack with right away. This one's worth seven. This one's worth eight. This one's worth seven. This one's worth four. Wrecker Rump has a discard clause. So it would actually take three cards from our hand to play Wrecker Rump for seven. That sucks. It's terrible. We'll see that in a moment. Most, Rhino, most of Reinar's discard cards are bad. Reincarnate would take two cards to do seven damage and Swing Big would take two cards to do eight. Now without Scabskins involved. So we're just going to pretend Scabskins isn't here. The most effective thing we can do with our hand would be to pitch to play Swing Big for eight and block with the other two cards. Okay, so we would have done eight damage. We would have blocked for six. Our hand value becomes 14. And if we were looking for this perfect world situation where every card's worth four, we technically lost two value off of that total. So that's a pretty good play. Blocking six, doing eight, that's that's a good Reinar play right there, right? But if we did the same example, playing seven, right? Playing Wrecker Rump here, pitching this blue, discard one of these two cards, we would have done seven and blocked for three. Seven, eight, nine, ten. So we would have lost even more value if we went with that card. Okay. And then final thing before we jump into the review of all the cards. Why are brute cards so hard to evaluate? And I did this whole deep dive in the brute math videos. Go check that out if you're interested. But brutes have a unique thing with how do you evaluate intimidate, right? Sometimes it has a value, sometimes it doesn't. And the value is always invisible to you. You have no idea if you intimidated a good card, right? So it's really hard to calculate the value of intimidate. We have draw discard cards in our deck sometimes. There's a lot of variants going on. Scab skins is a nightmare for you to calculate on every single turn if it's worth it to play scab skins or not. And then we have some crazy, crazy armor like skull crushers and gambler's gloves. We're the only class that has multiple pieces of equipment just to support our legendary. It's kind of ridiculous, right? Um, skull crushers versus gambler's gloves. What that does, how you calculate the math for that is kind of like a whole thing, right? So let's jump into the Reinar cards right now and I'll see you there. Okay, we're going to start with equipment because equipment is easy. Um, I am putting together a card evaluation spreadsheet, and this is going to be off my personal opinion. I'm going to share it in my Brute Discord. I have a bunch of uh, play. I have a play test group going on trying to find the optimal list for nationals for Reinar. So I'll get the input from all of those people in that little group. Uh, but right now we're going to go off mine, my thoughts. Uh, I could be wrong. Let's understand that. Uh, it is likely that I'll get some of this stuff wrong, but I'll give you my evaluation of each one of these cards and I'm putting it all into a spreadsheet. I'll share that with everybody. Okay, so these are the main pieces of equipment Reinar has as options. I ignored everything else that I really don't think is relevant to talk about, okay? Um, so maybe you have a weird list out there with like deep blue and rock and you need deep blue for rock or whatever, right? I'm not really considering that right now because I didn't even put rock as one of our play styles, even though it technically is. Is it really worth it to explore that right now? Probably not. Uh, sorry for you who really love that weapon. I love it too, but it's not competitively viable. So I'm going to go with what is mostly competitively viable. And if new cards come out in the next couple sets, we'll obviously come back and redo that. So we can start with our helmet. Our real options are Arcanite Skullcap, Bone Vizier, Crown of Dominion, Crown of Providence, and honestly, Skullhorn, okay? So we'll take the easiest ones out of the way first. Skullhorn is our AB choice. Uh, I'd give this card like a solid A, you know? Um, it is pretty good. It is AB2 on a stick. It is rare to have an AB2 piece of equipment. We're one of the few-ish, it's getting a little bit more common now, but few-ish classes who have this. Um, very good into Kano, very decent into Icelander, right? And it's text though, destroy Colhorn, Skullhorn, draw a card, then discard a random card, go again. Honestly, mostly irrelevant, right? Because it destroys the piece of equipment by activating it. So <laughs> in those arcane matchups, if you go to use this, your AB disappears instantly and you allow them a window to fire back unstopped, right? However, it can close a game. So it's, it's got text on it. Is it, are you going to use it? Probably not, but it happens. It will happen. I've won a game off school, school horn, right? That final intimidate made it so they couldn't block. Um, and then I guess we'll just talk about Nolrune. There's Nolrune helmet, 
chest piece, gloves, legs, right? Uh, most common choice is gloves, although my last Reinar list did use AB1 helmet only because I wanted to roll on scab skins and, you know, actually worked out better than I thought. It's just the best we have. It's, it's honestly kind of garbage, but because it's the best we have, it's like an A, you know, it's like the only option we have. Okay, so let's get in our helmet. Sorry about that. Arcanite Skull Cap used to be our default go-to option. It is block three on a helmet that also gives you arcane barrier if you pitch a blue. Uh, you know, you can do some really clever things on the arcane side with this, right? Intentionally get slightly below the Kano or the Icelander, right? Activate your Arcanite Skull Cap, and then suddenly you're pretty much invincible, right? Um, kind of cool. However, this being our, our old go-to was simply outclassed by Crown of Providence, right? Clown of Pro I mean, yes, it has one less block. So in a super tank matchup, maybe you're playing super tank club or whatever like that. Arcanite may be better. But honestly, the flexibility of Crown of Providence to get rid of your arsenal when you're getting CNC pummeled, to fix your blood rush hands in emergencies, right? This card is just way more flexible for our game plan, and that is to fire a blood rush perfectly. And sometimes you just got to rip a red out of your hand to hope you find a blue to make that happen. Really, really strong. Bone Vizier, not very good. <laughs> like... It's, it, it was kind of okay for a second, and then Crown of Providence came out, which, uh, yeah. So Bone Vizier, it's our common piece. Uh, you know, it's actually pretty decent for a common, okay? Um, it's actually really good. So commoners is a pretty decent piece of equipment. It has some interactions with, like, our draw discard cards. That's about it. Crown of Dominion, I've I've tried to do, like, King King of the Jungle Rhinar, I called it, where you just, like, go on full ape. Uh, the problem is, is that we don't get any benefit from playing a non-attack action, unlike Viscerai. So Viscerai can play cash in and then activate his hero text. Basically for us, you're, you're taking two health away from you. You're taking a filter away from you. And yes, you're drawing two cards to get you close to the blood rush, but you played a card. So it's like not really positive. Um, honestly, didn't, I didn't like it and it did enable some wild blood rush turns, but those were so far and few between that I didn't really find it necessary. Okay, so those are our helmets, right? Crown of Providence is our go-to option. S tier. Skullhorn is our go-to A, uh, A, B option. You know, pretty much A, A tier, S tier. Um, let's dive into chess pieces next. Barkbone Strapping is like a solid card. It has block on it that doesn't get destroyed. It lets you roll a dice. So you're going to be averaging, averaging, uh, you know, one to two resources from this. It's not bad. So... Uh, one to two resources, one time a game, most likely one, but you know, sometimes you'll get that three, but, uh, and it has a block, so it's actually not that bad. Um, but if you get the one resource, right, which is more often than not on Barkbone, Fendal's is just strictly better. In any game that goes past like six to nine turns, um, uh, Fendal's just exponentially increases your value over time. It works with things like Pummel. Uh, it's just like very, very, very strong incredibly strong card it's been in multiple lists since the beginning of the game it is or i guess since crew came out or or no whatever set uh, arcane or or no wtr but anyways it's very strong it is almost always slotted in a reinard deck the most recent discovery although it's not that recent anymore is heart and cross strap uh so you'll often see reinard lists now that run fendel spring tunic and heart and cross strap this card enables you to basically guarantee a perfect blood rush no matter what you draw and in aggro matchups this was the key to enabling our ability to beat things like phi this was in enabling our ability to beat things like aggro dash where you can block with your entire hand send a cnc block with your entire hand send a swing big just to get that super tempo turn find a blood rush with no pre preparation and fire it with heart and cross trap i run heart and cross trap almost more than i run fendals these days I put it extremely high rated for Reinar. Extremely high. Um, and that is it for chess pieces. Honestly, we basically have these two choices. Uh, you could argue Null Rune, but uh, no thank you. So yeah, Heart and Cross Trap or Fendals are basically in every list these days. Um, boots. We really only have two choices. We have Beaten Trackers and Scabskins. We've talked a lot about Scabskins already. Card is busted. So strong. So strong. But it can lose you the game. Beaten Trackers has showed up a lot recently. I mean, in Blitz, this card is dumb, right? You can basically always guarantee you can do 20 damage without having to roll dice for it. Pretty great. And you're seeing a lot of new variants of Reinar just trying to figure out how to beat Lexi. <clears throat> this just guarantees one pop-off turn with, like, Savage Feast or a big, like, discard into a Savage Beatdown, right? Card is really, really good, much better than I think a lot of people originally anticipated, 
just getting rid of some of the variants in those mega tight matchups is very, very, very strong. So you'll actually see that I took both beaten trackers and scab skins to my most recent RTN and I used them against Lexi, right? So our, our leg equipment is very strong, but we really only have these two options. And then we have weapons and arms, right? So unfortunately for us, we have gambler's gloves, skull crushers and Goliath gauntlet, right? Um, we have two dedicated pieces of equipment that support scav skins. Um, I think there's a very, <laughs> it's always been an ongoing conversation slash argument on skull crushers versus gambler's gloves. I am firmly in the gambler's gloves side of the uh, battle. Although there are really good points on Skull Crushers, right? It blocks one, which can be worth a lot against like a Snatch. And then obviously it can continuously generate value where, you know, Gambler's Gloves is really only usable one time. Fair. But Skull Crushers also blows up if you roll one in on turn zero. So these two pieces are pretty good. And then our really only other option is Goliath Gauntlet, which just <coughs> equates to your gloves giving you two value. So in Blitz, Goliath Gauntlet is a lot because two is quite a big total of health in a 20 health format but in cc you're only generating two points of value from goliath gauntlet so that means if you can get more than two value out of school crushers or, Gam or gambler's gloves it is not that strong and more often than not the value on my gambler's gloves is very high because i either save myself from rolling a one or i re-roll the turn that i had to hit like i had to this is my game winning opportunity I'm about to do 20 something damage or six. So Gambler's Gloves is really good in that scenario. So, you know, I would say solid C unless you're in Blitz for Goliath Gauntlet. Gambler's Gloves is like an A. However, it, you know, it honestly doesn't exist sometimes and it can be, it doesn't have a block value. And then Skull Crashers, I'd put it a B, but you know, a lot of people would argue that it's basically at the same level as Goliath Gauntlet. Okay, and our final decisions, weapons, right? Bone Basher, uh, meme, don't ever run it. Trash, F tier. Uh, cause it's just a bad romping club, right? I mean like, yeah, you, maybe you don't always turn on romping club and they basically are the same, but yeah, it's a meme. Just put this in your deck. Why would you want to lose out on the ability to make it a five? Okay. Uh, romping club used to be really strong. I would say it's fallen down a tier. So I put like a B or an A right now. Um, you know, it got stronger again now that old Tim's weapon was nerfed and removed from the game basically, because this is the only two for four weapon in the game. And well, I mean, I guess next to Bone Basher, but it's the only two for four. You know, you can you can send a blue and do four damage uh, even through a frostbite, which is pretty wild. And, you know, one for four as a fallback option is actually pretty good. Um, Mandible Claws. Unfortunately, these are like really below rate, in my opinion. Two for three damage with a conditional go again is pretty meh. You know, I mean, the only reason that these are so strong is because blood rush bellows makes them a two for five go again instantly right two for five go again isn't isn't the greatest but you don't need scab skins for it right so you basically are setting the floor of your blood rush to 18 damage if you're playing correctly so that's really the only reason we run this it is a little expensive for how much damage it does it does have the conditional go again there are other cards that turn them on so you can do like savage feast and the claw claw cnc which is kind of nuts but yeah they're good they're a necessary evil uh, ravenous meat axe. So this has the conditional text of making this a five. So two for three is below rate when you consider the fact that we have beaten trackers or bone basher and romping club, but the discard mechanic causes an intimidate, which is pretty nuts. So you make blocking difficult for your opponent and it comes in for five if you discard it a six and when built correctly, you're pretty much always doing that. And like we talked about earlier, there's some unique lines. So this maybe like a B plus to an A. I'm not sure on the vote until we like really deep dive the Ravenous Meat Axe lists. But your if your floor is consistent enough to be block nine, swing five, that's pretty good, right? That's better than Romping Club. But it does make you jump through some deck building hoop. Rock, <clears throat> talked about this already. Right now, I don't think there's a single competitive list with Rock, even though it's the coolest thing ever made. So this is like a CDF tier item. All right, so that's the equipment. Uh, I have it over here on the spreadsheet. Let's pop over there real quick. Okay, so here we have it. This is uh, the beginning of the spreadsheet that I'll be using throughout these videos. I will share this in the description below, but I do, I have graded all of our cards down here. Uh, we started with the equipment. 
Um, but you'll see that instead of using an S grade, I just use like AA++. The only reason is because I didn't like that it, you know, filtered the S's at the bottom. Then that didn't make very much sense to me. But yeah, this, the equipment spreadsheet, our equipment is pretty much, pretty much standardized, right? So I think that the grades are pretty much, you know, Crown of Providence, Fendals, Hardin Cross Reps, Gaskins, those are our power cards. And then we have cards that kind of support them, right? Um, we're going to be updating this list with every type of card throughout these video series. We have the equipments and the generics done. And before we jump into the generics, though, let's go over a couple more concepts that are really important to understand when you're making card evaluation choices. And let's let's dive into that real quick. OK, so the most important thing to understand when you're constructing any deck in Flesh and Blood is what the purpose of that deck is, right? And then you're, you're taking your concept of what that deck should be doing and you're building your cards around the concept. So for almost every single Reinar list out there, the concept is to do blood rushes perfectly, right? That is our best card. It is our win con most of the time, aside from like, you know, quad intimidate turns on the lethal stage. But to get to the point to do lethal damage, typically you want to do a blood rush bellows combo. Some decks don't revolve around Blood Rush as much, right? And those decks, things like the club version, they're looking to do the most efficient lines every single turn that they possibly can. And more often than not, they're not using Blood Rush to do those, right? They're either blocking nine, swinging four. They're blocking six, swinging seven or eight, right? They're kind of trying to value you down. However, most Blood Rush or most lists revolve around Blood Rush, right? So we're going to talk about that really, really clearly quickly right now so a perfect blood rush will do 18 to 20 damage and it's going to cost you a minimum of seven resources and a minimum of one discard okay that's a lot of resources so what is a perfect blood rush that would be uh pitching a blue playing blood rush bellows discarding a six clawing for five go again clawing for five go again and then playing something like uh swing big from arsenal for 10 that's 20 damage, costs seven resources, and it costs one additional card to be discarded for the claws of Blood Rush Bellows. So that's, that's a lot of hoops to jump through. That's a lot of resources. So you more often than not are presented with multiple opportunities to Blood Rush during a game. And you'll see that one of the biggest skill differences in good Rhinars versus average Rhinars versus bad Rhinars, whatever you want to call it, is their ability to fire off consistent Blood Rushes. And I mean, as you can read on the right of the screen, Blood Rush is a little bit of a random card right? It requires you to randomly discard a card from your hand. It requires you to draw two cards off the top of your deck. So you have a lot of unknowns happening on the turn that you play Blood Rush. It is very common, unfortunately, to draw two sink blows off the top of your deck for some reason, right? It's very much possibility, but you can actually play around that. You can, okay? So let's start off with the three main ways you're going to play Blood Rush. There actually is a fourth, and I'll talk about that a little bit. But you have your five card blood rush, which is you have four cards in your hand. And most likely the best case scenario is a two cost attack, brute attack in your arsenal. Four cards, two of them are sixes. One of them's a blue and one's a blood rush bellows. You discard one of the two random cards. You draw them up and pretty much no matter what happens in this scenario, you're going to be able to claw claw play that card from your arsenal. And but to be fair, even on a five card hand, five cards if you don't draw a yellow anywhere if you have all reds in your hand and you draw a two more reds you're gonna need tunic to do it which is kind of crazy to think about right that's how dangerous or how easy it is to mess up a blood rush is sometimes it can fail on a five card hand okay um and then you have your four card blood rush which is often the better version right i know it's kind of weird to think about it but a five card blood rush means that Unless you roll scab skins or have a natural go again card in your hand, you're probably going to have extra cards. And that means that you didn't get the most value out of your turn. That means you didn't block at all, right? You just took all of their damage and you did 20. And if you have two cards left over, what a waste, right? So more often than not, I'm doing things like a four card blood rush, right? I'm going to block with one of the least valuable cards from my hand and a piece of equipment, stop some sort of on hit, and then I'm going to fire back an 18 to 20 damage blood rush. So this one, four cards, has an acceptable, in my opinion, risk tolerance, okay? But it still requires a blue to be drawn off the top. It requires a blue to be pitched, or it requires you to have tunic and a yellow drawn, okay? So that's a lot to ask. And then a three-card blood rush, which is desperation mode, 
right? It means you can't have a card in your arsenal because you only have three cards to play with and you need to discard one of them, right? So it means you have a blood rush in your hand, a blue in your hand, and a six power attack in your hand. And that means that you're you're hoping that the card you draw off the top of the deck is a blue, right? It requires blue and a tunic to fire. Now, this one is super risky. You do this when you need to win. And oftentimes you do it when you're okay with not getting 18 damage out of your blood rush. You do it when you're okay with getting like eight plus a claw maybe, right? Or just claw, claw for 10. Now, of course, there are ways around this, right? Heart and Cross Trap is a card that we just talked about, which can enable pretty much all of these to fire no matter what, all right? But let's let's jump into uh, Tabletop Simulator real quick and let's kind of give you an example of what it really looks like, okay? Okay, so here we are. We're playing a game against a wonderful Dash opponent. We've drawn up our hand. We see that we've got the beautiful Blood Rush combo ready. Now, and I, I, can't, I can't stress this enough, right? Having a card in your arsenal, a two cost, six attack. Two cost is very important on these turns and I will show you why in a moment, but having a two cost six card in your arsenal for when you draw a blood rush is incredibly important, incredibly important, right? Um, it just pretty much guarantees that you don't have to worry about variants. So here we are. What I would normally do, you always want to, you pretty much always want to start a blood rush with a blue if you can help it at all. Yellow is your worst case scenario. Red is you are only firing the blood rush, blood rush because you are desperate, right? So you pitch your your blue, and we'd randomly discard one of these two cards, okay? Right? Beautiful. We have two resources floating, and you'll see how incredibly dangerous blood rushes can be if you're not prepared. This two costs in our arsenal, right? So two resources floating, we claw, and look at that. We drew all reds, right? Going to have to throw two more reds into the pile to claw again. Then we're going to have to pitch our final red here and use tunic to send this for 20. That was a five-card hand. Five cards and we used our tunic we used every card in our hand and we barely had enough resources to fire a perfect blood rush right that is how tight this cost curve is a single frostbite would have ruined this turn so let's loop that back put our claws back put swing big back in our arsenal and draw up our blood rush once again now there are interesting cards that interact with blood rushes extra well right? We'll talk about that beast within skull crack and stuff like that. They are basically blood rush insurance cards that just make it even easier for you to fire a blood rush. But now let's just say, uh, I don't know, dash sends a CNC at us, right? Who you're, I don't know, whatever CNC. So we're looking and we're like, okay, well we can't stop it with just our armor. So we're going to have to give up one of these two cards and we'll block with this, protect our swing big, because we know, we know that losing swing big is way, way more damaging to our value per card next turn than it would be to gamble that we don't hit a yellow, right? So boom, we block, we lose our equipment, but we saved our swing big. We're gonna do this again, pitch a blue, play blood rush, discard our card, two floating, we're gonna draw two. And would you look at that? We got, oh no, we got a perfect amount of resources again to claw, claw, tunic, swing big. Right. So when you go down to a four card blood rush, you have to draw a yellow and use tunic or you have to draw a blue. Right. You have to. And this is why in the next slide we're going to get into in a moment. It is so absolutely important that the blue, yellow and six ratios of Reinhard decks are structured in a very particular way. And then let's go to our final, final scenario. I like to call it the Hail Mary blood rush. Right. Three cards, and we're just gonna shuffle the deck so we have a random draw off the top here, right? Three cards only. We're gonna draw two cards off the top, and boom. You know, actually, not the worst case scenario. Not the worst, because at least we've got 10 here, but let's just draw six, okay? We're gonna claw. We're gonna be forced to make the decision to just send eight and five, right? And this is one of the biggest problems with Reinar right now, is that the in order to get our six density up, we have to play a lot of cards that cost three and three is a lot more than two when <laughs> when you're looking at spending seven resources and discarding a card for a play. Right. Um, this is an OK blood rush. I mean, for three cards coming in for eight, nine, ten, eleven, that's not bad. Three card eleven. It's OK. It's like one away from perfect. Right. 
But let's run it back one more time just, just to see what happens if you have a two-cost card in your arsenal, right? Oof, this is a gross turn, right? So in, in a game like this, we'd be looking at our hand. We'd be like, okay, well, we're stuck, right? I'm going to defend with this card from hand, maybe defend with some equipment. I'm going to pitch this blue. I'm going to blood rush, discard a six, draw two cards off the top. And we still have two floating. And you'll see how crazy this is. Uh, we're going to claw, pitch, claw, one floating. Even with drawing a blue and pitching a blue, we can't afford a three cost card in our arsenal. And that's random. Like this is how often three cards will brick you on a blood rush. Three cost cards, more often than not, brick you on a blood rush. Just, just ruin everything, right? We would have to have tunic available to fire this card. So you would have to play a blue, pitch a blue. You'd have to draw a blue and you'd have to have tunic up to do a four card hand blood rush with a three cost in your arsenal. It's trash, trash. Okay. Nuts. It's crazy how tight the, the cost curve on blood rush is. It's crazy. But real quick, let's just talk about some supporting cards here. I don't know why they fell beneath the table. There's one more, one more. Where is it? There it is. Okay. So clear the board state. One, one thing that Reinar has going for him to fix cost curves is Beast Within and Skullcrack. Skullcrack, if discarded on a Blood Rush turn, gives you one free resource. And as you can, you saw, very routinely, we're one resource away from doing our Blood Rush Bellows because we're constantly either having to use Tunic or we're if we have a three cost in our arsenal and you know we were you can't do it without Tunic, you're going to be one resource short. So Skullcrack will fix that problem. You discard it, you gain your resource, you can attack. And then Beast Within is probably the easy the best case scenario right beast within pretty much guarantees that you're going to be able to fire a four card blood rush uh for you know a four card only blood rush pretty much guarantees it however obviously most of you people at home know that beast within comes with a pretty major detriment and that detriment is that sometimes it'll do seven damage to you right um and then we also talked about heart and cross strap heart and cross strap pretty much nullifies the four card blood rush issue if you have a two cost card in your arsenal because you just crack it and you play it for free. So it means you can pitch all of your cards into your claws and then you just crack heart and cross strap and you swing like a, you know, a two for six, right? Perfect. And then the only interesting interaction is there is a way to do more than 20 damage on a blood rush. There's like, there's a handful of ways, right? One is having a five card hand and drawing a barraging beat down. Or drawing a two for six, right? This will enable you to go to 24 damage, which is pretty much optimal without scab skins or without cards like Pulping and Wild Ride. Or you'll have a card like Savage Beatdown. Uh, Savage Beatdown is very expensive to play. In incredibly expensive. I had, I swear I had it somewhere, but incredibly expensive to play. And it is very difficult to get this card to line up. And a lot of the time it'll sit in your arsenal forever before you can fire it. However, these two cards will really allow you to push Blood Rushes to an insane level. So if that is your play style, you can take a little bit of a more of a risk and put one of these in your arsenal instead of a two for six. Or you can put one of these in your arsenal instead of a two for six. It does increase the risk of your Blood Rush a lot exponentially. Um, or if you're playing with a card like Pulping and Wild Ride, then you can, you know, send eight, eight and five, right? Which is more than five, five, eight. Okay. Okay, so that's the example. Now let's jump into uh, deck construction for Reinar. All right, so now that you understand why Blood Rushes are so expensive and why they're so difficult to get out correctly, now we have to understand the concept of like what makes up a Reinar deck. So your typical Reinar deck, now we're talking about the main, the main play style right now. Any deck that revolves around Blood Rush Bellows, we're not talking about Medex decks right now, and we're not talking about Club decks because they're a little different, but we're talking about the standard Blood Rush style, right? You're looking at a, a typical structure of 17 to 21 blues. You're looking at 15 yellows, and you're looking at 24 to 28 reds, depending on like how many blues you picked, okay? Why is this the way it is? Well, Reinar is very hungry for blues because our cards cost basically two or three on our regular turns and then on blood rushes you need to pitch a yeah, a blue right you need to pitch a blue otherwise you saw that you'll almost always fall one resource short the only time you can really get away with it is if like you have a beast within or skull crack okay so you need a blue and the magic number that i play with is 17 but it's, it could be 18 right you basically have a one in four chance of finding that blue card 
some people play a little bit higher in the 20s, right? And the reason they like that is because when they draw those random cards off the top, they're typically blues, right? However, the big problem with blues in Reinar and the real gate that keeps him from being absolutely monstrously overpowered is that only three of our blues are sixes. So intrinsically, every blue you put into the deck is another miss and another card that you can't discard randomly to Blood Rush Bellows or Savage Feast or Alpha Rampage or Savage Beatdown, right? So the more blues you play with, the less consistent your discards get, which means you could get stuck with a Blood Rush in your hand and not enough sixes for multiple turns. So you want to find that balance between having enough fuel to power your turns and having enough sixes to do them correctly. So I've landed on 17, but you'll see the ratios change like quite a bit between the major decks, like 17, 18, 21, right? Um, typically you're around there and you use your blues to pitch or to block with 90% of the time, right? And then 15 yellow seems to be pretty common. You see 12 sometimes, you'll see more in like, you see way more in Medax decks, but they're a little bit different, right? 15 yellow cards, three copies of your Blood Rush because it's our best card. And then 12 copies of our best yellow six power cards. Now, you saw that drawing yellows in our Blood Rush turns is very important. So we take the best handful of Reinar six yellows and we stick them in the deck. Right now, those are typically the ones that don't say discard a card on them, right? Because discard cards are very expensive for how much damage they do. So you're going to put things like Beast Within, which, you know, has its own triggered ability. You're going to put things like Riled Up that come in for nine on a Blood Rush on a bad day, right? Um, stuff like that. And then these are used typically as pitching on your Blood Rush turns, as discarding fodder for Savage Feast and Blood Rush Bellows and Alpha Rampage. And then they're pretty much our floor of damage, right? Block six, do six, right? So uh, block six, pitch a blue, swing with a yellow three cost card, right? That's our, our density, six. And then the rest of the slots go to our red cards. Red cards should be our hardest hitting attacks. They should be tech cards like Erase Face, CNC, Humble. And they need to be our best defensive options like Sink Below, Fate for Scene, Sigil of Solace, um, Oasis Respite, right? So those are our, our cards that are our power cards that we want to play on those big Blood Rush turns, that we want to play between Blood Rush turns. They're the cards that keep us alive to find our next Blood Rush, like Sink Below. And then there are tech options for matchups that are difficult to beat normally. Think Aggro Dash and Erase Face, right? It just shuts her down for a turn. She has to give us two cards or she can't do anything. So the reds are really, really tight. You'll see a lot of lists don't have very much room for reds because unfortunately, 17 of our cards are blue and 15 of them are yellow sixes. Doesn't leave us very much room to have that many reds. So our reds really have to have a purpose. And you want, um, on average, you can wiggle this ratio as much as you want. You want about 50% of your deck at minimum to be a six power card. And that's because consistency, once you start getting below 30 cards on blood rushes, disappears, right? Your alpha rampages, your blood rushes, your barraging, your barragings, your savage beatdowns suddenly become useless if you don't have enough sixes to fuel them right? Okay. So now that you understand why we're picking these kind of cards, what colors we're picking, the, the, why we don't have that much room for reds in our deck, let's jump into the generics and we'll talk about why certain generics are good and why some aren't. We'll see there. All right. So now that you understand why red cards are so important in Reinar and why we have so few slots for them. And now that you understand the requirements of having six density in your deck and having cards that say brute on them because they get buffed by blood rush bellows, we're going to talk about generics. Generics really, honestly, should have a very concrete purpose in a Reinar list because they distract from your main goal most of the time. Unless you're playing like a club value list, these will distract you from playing Blood Rushes perfectly as soon as you see them, right? So they really need to have like a very, very high value to your game plan. So I took all of them, basically all of the ones that I would I've seen considered um, and I put them in a pile. We're going to skip over a lot of these because they're kind of generic concepts, but we'll start with this first one here. Amnesia. Um, it's an amazing card in Takatsu. It's pretty bad in everybody else, right? So this is what I'm going to call a meta tech card. Okay. You're going to put this in. If the meta tells you that you're going to play a bunch of Katsus, you're going to put this in. If you're not playing a bunch of Katsus, you're going to take it out because it doesn't support our game plan of blood rushing for 18 to 20 damage. 
So keep that in mind. And then you're going to have another style of card here, Barraging Beat Down or Barraging Bonhide. Like I'd give this card a C and uh, we'll go over my spreadsheet later. But this is what I call a value card. It is coming in for eight damage, which is above rate. It's on rate, actually, right? Two for eight is good. It's very good. You saw Bolander use cards like this to great extent. However, it distracts from our game plan. It doesn't say Brood on it. And then you'll see that almost all cards like this block for two. They cost three, they block for two, and they don't get buffed buff by Blood Rush, right? So this is a, a value card. If you're playing a value Rhinar list, this card's pretty good, right? Comes in for eight. But we have plenty of Rhinar cards that say Brood on them that come in for seven or eight, right? So those are much better on a Blood Rush turn than a Barraging Bronhide is. So unless you're playing a super value list, these, card, these types of cards are meh, right? Brothers in Arms is kind of the same thing. It's got conditional text on it. We're not the best at spending our resources on our opponent's turn unless you're going crazy with like Oasis Respites and stuff like that. So this card is like, it's a six. Yes, it doesn't say Brood on it. It doesn't block that well unless you're over pitching. So it's not that good. Cadaver's Contraband, meta pick, right? Super good into Dromai. It is pretty decent into aggro decks once you've already played a Blood Rush, but it blocks two. It doesn't say Brood on it. Same thing. This card's very good in the Dromai though. And then you have these uh, other type of card that I would call like in turn enhancers, right? Captain's calls, stuff like that, right? This one will allow you to get go again. If the meta is telling you that you have to have multiple sources of go again in order to win, think like Aura Prism, cards like this get a little better, but they're non-sixes. They're, they're reds, blues, yellows. So they take away from your six density. They don't block for three and they are very card intensive. You have to play this card. You have to pitch for your six cost attack or your two cost six attack. And then you have to follow up with some of the weapons. So you're, you're talking four card, five card plays, right? And our damage on multiple card plays is not that high. So cards like this typically don't do that well. Command Conquer, best generic in the game. Play it. It's the best. Three block, six power, destroys arsenal, two cost, nuts the only thing that would make this card better if it said brute right here on it right uh cut down the size meta call card if the if the aggro decks are never blocking and getting one card out of their hand is worth an incredible amount of value then cut down the size might get better demolition crew should play it only if you're kano ko down and dirty only purpose of this card ever in a reinard deck is to try and have codex tech so you don't get ruined by codex randomly right you can take this out of your graveyard put it in your arsenal and block with it Saves you two life, but it does nothing else for you. It blocks terribly. It doesn't say Brood on it. You know, the normal. E-Strike, however, one of the few non-six, non-Brute cards that I would say, like, good choice. All right? Uh, all three modes on this card are active for Reinar. You can roll for drawing a card, right? You can play this a zero for five draw a card. It can fix hands. It can give you a blue. It can do stuff like that. It gives you plus two, so it's a two for seven, which is on rate with a pretty much most of our good brute cards and then it's one of the few ways reinar can spend four cards in one turn go in for five go again follow up with a six right you can even do like some crazy plays uh in the middle of like blood rush bellows turns to kind of like fix your hand draw extra cards stuff like that super good card does have the problem of not being a six and not being a brute race face is a meta tech option pick it when viscerai and dash and any hero who's hit by it are good fate for scene um these kind of cards, Fate for Seeing and Sink Below, are multi-purpose for Reinar, right? They block four, so they let us survive until our next Blood Rush turn. And then opting and fixing your hand are super important because regardless of what card's on top, if it doesn't say Blood Rush, it goes to the bottom, right? So you're filtering. Free Wheeling Renegades. Um, some Brutes were talking about this card. I think this card's meh, but some Brutes were talking about this as a really good way for Scab Skins. You know, you pitch a blue, play a two cost six, follow up with a Free Wheeling Renegades. That's a pretty good three card play. Um, it is scabs dependent and it doesn't block well and it doesn't say brood on it, but I totally understand the value and it's probably better than I'm giving it credit for. Uh, this is another value card. However, keep in mind, anytime a card says if you have less health than your opponent, it is very dangerous for Reinar to pick these kind of cards. We all know how good this card is. Bolander showed it off for an entire season of how utterly powerful this card can be. However, Reinar has a problem. And that's you can't really control how much health your opponent's at. Icelander can. If we get Blood Rush, a perfect Blood Rush on turn two, we're going to fire it. And we might be 20 health ahead of our, our opponent for most of the game, right? And that makes this card a lot less consistent, a lot less good. It's also cost three. It gets in the way of Blood Rushes. So I haven't had very good luck with this card. 
Um, healing bomb. I tried it. <laughs> I tried full tank, full heal Reinar. It's better than I thought. It's not very good. Humble. Meta tech card. If Azuri is the best deck in the game, it's good. If, Dr if Dory is the best deck in the game, it's good. If Dromai is the best deck in the game, it's good. Pick it then. Lead the charge. Same concept. Uh, if you need, go again desperately. The blue one is actually pretty decent. Life for a life. This is a club card. It's pretty okay. One for four plus maybe gaining a life is all right. Nourishing Emptiness. Another generic that blocks three, but it's only good on turn one. Oasis Respite. Nuts if you have Kano's in your meta. Uh, also very good against Dominate decks. Also very good against Dorinthia. Also very good against uh, On Hits. Best one played with Tunic. I'd give this card like an A. If Kano's mega good, it's like an S, right? Uh, but it is expensive. We're not the best at spending resources on our opponent's turn. Like We're not that good at it. Out Muscle, if you need Gogan. It's okay. I've tried it. Bravo's liked it for a while. Peace of Mind, same problem. We're not good at spending resources on our opponent's turn. Peace of Mind gets better if you have things like uh, Oasis Respite in your list, and then you have things like Brothers in Arms in your list. But at that point, why are you playing Rhinar? Pummel. Right now, maybe not the best card because I think the decks that we're targeting like Lexi really don't care about losing a card. And we have so few on hits, unlike Guardian. When Guardian pummels a card, they're turning on the text of their card on top of dealing four damage on top of removing a card from your hand. We're uh, more often than not just doing four damage and removing a card from your hand. So certain times Pummel is going to be a rock star in Reinar list, and sometimes it's not. It really is meta dependent. And right now I'm not so sure it's the best. Another value card, decent. Reinforce Align is amazing versus Dominate decks. This is a meta pick. If Azalea is in your, your neighborhood, this card's good. If Dorinthia is the most powerful deck in your neighborhood, this card's amazing. If Bravos are super prevalent, this card's good. Remember to keep your attack action density higher if you're running multiple copies of this card. So change some of your blues to be attack action so you have more targets. Scar for a scar. Um, some people try it out and they almost always come back off of it. And I think it's because the same problem. It's a four, so it ruins your density. It doesn't block very well. You can't control your health like you can on other heroes. So the text of this card could just randomly be off on turn two for the whole game, and there's nothing you can do about it. Now you have this weird dead card in your hand. Um, any card that lets you opt or draw more cards are starting to become more prevalent in Reinar lists. I would say, like, I'm running Blue Whisper of the Oracle right now and testing. It just helps you find a Blood Rush faster. Typically, you'd run the blue version of this card because our blues are pretty meh, and it blocks three, and it just helps you get your Blood Rushes faster. Sigil. I think this card's cracked. I love this card. I love it so much, but it is getting a little bit less good this season. And that's because this card really shines as a uh, like a pocket card that you can use to bluff Arsenal. So like if you're getting CNC pummeled, you can just sigil out and not lose a card in your arsenal. And it also is super good against heroes that do less than three or more than three damage on their average card. So think dash. She'll sometimes come in for four and then she'll come in for two and then she'll come in for four. So when you're blocking with your cards from your hand, you're actually losing value because you're either over blocking or under blocking, right? Sigil will actually just correct those blocks across a turn, which keeps you alive for a lot longer than you'd think. I love that card. Sink Below is the better version of Fate for Scene for Reinar, in my opinion. It helps you dig for Blood Rushes, keeps you alive. This is another value card. Meh. Uh, trade In. There was a while where Reinars were talking about this. It's kind of interesting because like if you play it from Arsenal and you discard a beast within it's card positive, which is kind of cool. Same thing. Two block, non-brute, non-six gets in the way. Unmovable tech option. Um, you know, it's really good for tall and dominate decks. And if there's not very many of those, it's not a very good card. Whisper, we talked about the blue one's pretty good. I'd give it like a B, C, something like that. Um, maybe even A, depending on how much more the testing goes. It's just like if you get an extra blue in your hand, you can just dig for a blood rush. And sometimes it's uh, it can also help you on a blood rush turn. That's about it. Wounded Bull says health on it. Blocks to non-brute. We've talked about this a million times. Same thing with Rate Wreak Havoc. It's a discount CNC. Says generic non-brute. Blocks to. Also, why would you run this if you have CNC? Now we're going to get into some of the more interesting cards here. Art of War. I actually don't know. <laughs> when I first started playing Leviah, obviously I ran this card all the time. And for some reason, I played with it in Reinar for a little bit early, and then I never played with it again. And I never really practiced or tested it. However, no other Reinar lists really have it. So it can't, there's got to be a reason 
people don't like this card in Reinar. It's probably the cost curve. It's probably the random drop. But uh, I would say I don't really know how to rate this card. I should test it. Remembrance cards broke. We can't get fatigued. We have six copies of Blood Rush in our deck. It's nuts. It is nuts. Uh, should honestly be banned. Back in the days, you can't believe it, but we used to run this card when we were trying to fatigue out um, Starvo. You have to get it in your arsenal in order for it to have full value. It does pitch yellow, which is kind of nice. However, it's too slow in this current meta, so I wouldn't run it. Tome of Fiendal 2, I love this card in Reinar. It's so good to get this in your arsenal, and then you can do like this crazy tunic two-card play, heal four, swing eight, or whatever, right? Pretty nuts, but right now Lexi's going so fast, and some of these heroes are so detrimental to your arsenal zone, like Azuri, that getting this in there and keeping it there is very difficult. Um, so I stopped running it. I kind of think I might go back to one copy, but you know, I would play with this card and see if it fits your play style. It's very unique. Energy Potion, if Ice decks become the best again, this will go up. If you're playing a Savage Beatdown centric list, this card is very good because Savage Beatdown is so expensive, but it is slow. The meta's moved a lot faster, so you don't really have much time to get E pods out. However, we're one of the few classes that can roll scabs, drop an E pod, and do something else. Okay. I have Aphidia. I think the stocks on this card are going back up. I ran this a long time ago. I took it out because I didn't like it because it doesn't block. It can mess up my reckless swings. It hurts my pitch stack later on. However, I think the meta is so fast that it's definitely worth taking another look at this card. Heart of Fandal, it has the text clause on it. It's not consistent for us. Lunging Press. <laughs> I really like this card. It's a meme. I wouldn't run it, but I put a one of in my list for a while just to scare my opponents because they didn't expect it hitting a cnc with a lunging press from your arsenal is amazing right it's hilarious hitting a race face on a dash when they just gave you two cards and now they still can't do anything is kind of awesome mean tier doesn't block but our blues are pretty bad rouse the ancients is actually maybe good i think it's close to being good if we get a couple more good cards that go above seven power i think rouse the ancients maybe will start showing up in reinar lists of course, you're going to have to change your blue density and you're going to have to change a couple things. But this card is like maybe on the horizon. Maybe. It's better in Levia. And then Time Snap Potion. If you're desperate for action points, uh, you know, maybe. But yeah, I wouldn't. I don't think it's very good right now. Okay, so that's all of the generics that we reasonably have available to us. Uh, like I said, all of this will be in the spreadsheet. Actually, let me just go show you the spreadsheet real all quick. Right. So here we go. Beautiful spreadsheet here. Filter it. Blah, blah, blah. It's in the description below. So I rated all the cards. I gave some notes on them. I'll continue to enhance this as we uh, go through these videos and I'll make better and better notes and all of that kind of stuff. But we're starting here. And uh, yeah, keep in mind that generics need to serve a very specific purpose in our list. They need to be there for a very, very good reason. And typically, the more generics you're running, the harder it is to pull off your big brute things, right? So you're looking at like, the, necess the necessities, meta picks, right? Like uh, humble, meta picks like a race face. You're looking at things like uh, D-Reacts, Sigils, Oasises, right? Those are the, those are there because they keep us alive to find our blood rushes. They keep us, they, they make us find our blood rushes faster. So you really don't want to have too many of these in your list, right? Because next session, we're going to dive into all of the brute cards. And we're going to talk about the concepts of why certain cards are better and some aren't. And then we're going to really get into like some details on like deck construction and how you're putting together a list that will function and all of that kind of fun stuff. So yeah, long video. Thank you all for watching. I appreciate it so much. I hope this helps you on your Reinar journey. And this will be a multi-part series. We're talking, I don't know how many videos, right? But we're going to dive into every list, every detail, and it's going to be, it's going to be fun <laughs> or, or boring. We're not sure. See you around. Have a great day.